Hello. The moon isn't just hostile, it actively wants to kill you. And it has thousands of ways to do it. The vacuum will rip the air from your lungs, radiation will burn your cells deep inside your body. Dust, so fine and razor sharp it can scratch metal, will seep through any spacesuit, shred your lungs into bloody pulp, and strip the skin off your body. Every breath, every step here is a deadly risk. The last time a human set foot on Earth's only natural satellite was in December 1972 during NASA's Apollo 17 mission. More than half a century has passed since then, and humanity has yet to hear something like, Houston, tranquility base here, the eagle has landed. The landing of 12 men on the moon remains one of NASA's greatest achievements, if not the greatest. During each of the six lunar landing missions, two astronauts descended to the surface while one remained in the orbiting module. In this way, 12 humans set foot on the moon. Each time they ventured down, the astronauts collected rock samples, took photographs, conducted experiments, planted flags, and then returned home. Yet these relatively brief visits during the Apollo program never established a lasting human presence on Earth's satellite. After the crew of Apollo 17 made the final landing on December 11, 1972, spending just over three days on the surface, more than half a century has passed. Today, there are many reasons to return to that vast, dust-covered world. For years, researchers and entrepreneurs have advocated building a lunar base to host a permanent crew. A continuous research station on the moon is the next logical step. From there, Earth would only be three days away. Such a base could serve as a fuel depot for deep space missions, a platform for building unprecedented space telescopes, a stepping stone for a journey to Mars, and a key to unlocking ancient scientific mysteries about our planet and the origins of its lone satellite. Constructing such a station could even ignite prosperity beyond Earth, perhaps one day fueled by a thriving industry of lunar space tourism. NASA has promised that the next human visit to the moon will take place under the Artemis program, one that will also include the first women to walk on the lunar surface. The new lunar program, named Artemis, was created in 2017, and at first it was planned that astronauts would return to the moon in 2024. The mission was later pushed back to 2025, then again to 2026, and now, as announced at a recent press conference, NASA officials have confirmed yet another delay. Due to technical problems with the spacecraft that is supposed to deliver astronauts to the moon, the return to Earth satellite will not take place before the middle of 2027. But let us return to the main reasons behind such delays. What has stood in the way of reliving one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind once more, this time in the 21st century? The greatest obstacle for any space program, especially human spaceflight, has always been its staggering cost. NASA's budget for the 2022 fiscal year amounted to $24.04 billion, $800 million short of the president's request of $24.8 billion. For 2023, the Biden administration asked Congress to raise it to nearly $26 billion. For comparison, the U.S. defense budget for that same year was about $858 billion. Under Donald Trump, NASA's projected budget was set to shrink by 20%, from $25 billion in 2025 to $20 billion in 2026. At first glance, these figures might seem enormous, but one must remember, this sum is spread across the agency's many divisions and ambitious projects, such as the James Webb Space Telescope, 
the Space Launch System heavy rocket, and far-reaching missions to the Sun, Jupiter, Mars, the asteroid and Kuiper belts, and even the very edge of the solar system. For comparison, NASA's share of the U.S. federal budget reached its peak of 4% in 1965. Over the past 40 years, it has remained below 1%, and in the last 15 years, it has dropped to around 0.3% of the federal budget. In NASA's 2005 report, it was estimated that returning to the moon would cost the agency about $104 billion over a 13-year period, roughly $170 billion today adjusted for inflation. By comparison, the Apollo program would amount to about $150 billion in today's dollars. This means NASA's budget is far too small to carry out plans for a lunar landing. The true driving force behind government support and commitment to returning to the moon is the will of the American people, who elect politicians and help shape their priorities. Yet public interest in exploring Earth's only satellite has not been strong enough. Even at the height of the Apollo program, after Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong had already walked on the moon, only 53% of Americans believed the project was fully justified. For a long time afterward, that number hovered below 50%. Today, however, most Americans believe that NASA should make returning to the moon a top priority. In a December 2018 Insider survey, more than 57% of respondents said such a step was important for the agency. Yet of that number, only about 38% supported sending humans, while the remaining 19% felt robots could carry out the exploration instead. Many space enthusiasts have long expected that a permanent base would soon be built on the moon. However, the harsh conditions on the lunar surface make it far from an ideal place for human settlement and development. NASA's limited budget is not the only reason why humans have not returned to the moon. Earth's satellite is, above all, a deadly trap, scarred with countless craters and boulders that has existed for more than 4.5 billion years. The new lunar race faces a multitude of challenges, from lethal radiation to the constant resupply of provisions for colonists and even the difficulties of using a toilet under conditions of microgravity. But here we will focus on another, less obvious problem how to protect colonists from lunar dust. It poses a danger not only to humans, but also to equipment, and fighting it will cost billions of dollars. In the 1960s, the legendary science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke published the novel A Fall of Moon Dust, envisioning a 21st century where humans had colonized the moon and traveled across its surface in dust cruisers. Back in the mid-20th century, some scientists and thinkers speculated that the moon might be covered with a layer of dust 10 meters thick. In the United States, as preparations for the first crewed lunar landing advanced, NASA developed the Ranger program, sending unmanned probes to capture photographs and video footage of the surface. Ranger 7, launched in July 1964, took high-quality images before crashing onto the moon it revealed that the dust layer was only a few centimeters thick. Still, NASA had no clear answers. Would the dust cling to spacesuits and equipment? How would it affect human movement? And could it interfere with the separation of the lunar module's ascent stage from its descent stage? Engineers anticipated that the engines would stir up dust during landing, so the Apollo 11 crew was trained to deal with poor visibility, and the spacecraft was equipped with numerous sensors. The landing was intended to be as gentle as possible in order to minimize the impact of the surface on the spacecraft. The first humans on the moon quickly discovered that lunar dust is extremely fine and sharp. Because there is no wind or water, the particles are not smoothed down and remain jagged. The adhesion is so strong that Apollo astronauts compared the clinging dust to a living, creeping substance that coated their legs, arms, and helmets with a thin layer of fine particles. 
The Surveyor Program and the Apollo experiments helped scientists conclude that microscopic particles seem to hover above the lunar surface almost without interacting with one another. New layers are constantly formed as meteorites strike the moon's surface, heating and mixing the rock, which consists mainly of silicon. The moon is covered with a thin, talc-like upper layer of lunar dust several centimeters deep in some regions, which is electrostatically charged through interaction with the solar wind, abrasive, extremely adhesive, and very quickly contaminates spacesuits, vehicles, and systems. Attempts to remove the contamination resulted in deep scratches on spacesuits and equipment. Dust accumulation on machinery could also cause overheating by actively absorbing solar radiation. To study the properties of lunar regolith, the upper soil layer, astronauts collected samples in different locations and sealed them in airtight aluminum containers. By the time the storage units returned to Earth, they were already damaged. The dust had scratched the walls and ceiling components. In the early 1960s, NASA leadership was concerned about cosmic radiation, low gravity, and the astronauts' psychological challenges. But it was the dust that caused the greatest difficulties. Many astronauts recalled it as the main challenge on the moon. They brought lunar dust back to Earth not only in sealed containers, but also on themselves. In the mid-1960s, when conclusions about the composition of lunar dust were still being drawn from photographs, medical experts even suggested placing returning crews into quarantine. NASA feared that lunar dust particles might contain pathogens that could threaten not only humans, but also plants. For 21 days, returning astronauts were kept in isolation, so their meetings with journalists, families, and national leaders looked somewhat comical. Every gram of extraterrestrial material the astronauts brought back was considered valuable, so they were asked not to clean their spacesuits too thoroughly upon return to Earth. Dust penetrated the lunar module and then the command module, where the crew inhaled it for several days on their way home. Astronauts compared the smell of lunar dust to gunpowder. The comparison raises questions. Lunar dust does not match gunpowder in composition, and the smell disappears on Earth. The reason may lie in humidity, which is virtually non-existent on the Moon. Details about the effects of lunar dust on humans began to emerge later, after its properties were studied more closely. Russell Kirschman, a pathologist working with NASA, spoke about silicosis, a disease that often affects miners and could similarly harm astronauts. Lunar dust particles can combine with terrestrial silicates and cause lung fibrosis. However, regolith may harm more than just the lungs. In 2018, a study showed that under laboratory conditions, Lunar dust destroys up to 90% of brain cells, although its mechanism of action remains unclear. Scientists advise developing multi-layer protection systems before sending humans on future expeditions. During the Apollo era, doctors did not know whether inhaling the dust would be harmful. Only one astronaut reported lung pain and described symptoms resembling bronchitis. The illness was dubbed lunar hay fever, which required no treatment and resolved on its own. In 1969, Apollo 12 was equipped with brushes, cloths, and a vacuum cleaner to fight dust. None of these methods worked. The deposits would not come off the equipment or the spacesuits, and the astronauts voiced their ironic frustration. Watch how the dust rises during the Grand Prix drive of the lunar rover on Apollo 16. On the moon, it is difficult to use adhesive tape, which astronauts and cosmonauts often rely on to repair many things aboard spacecraft. The Apollo 17 crew repaired the rear fender of the lunar rover with gray duct tape, but it didn't work on the first try. Dust instantly stuck to the adhesive, tore it apart, and the joined parts would not hold. Today, hundreds of scientists and inventors are working to adapt the Apollo experience and that of unmanned missions. 
engineers are developing methods to prevent dust from sticking to various surfaces and to remove particles that have already settled. Over the past 50 years, humanity has learned to create new materials and mechanisms that either resist dust adhesion or withstand its effects. The new lunar spacesuit is being designed with a minimal number of zippers, rivets, and buttons to prevent dust from penetrating them. Materials are being treated with compounds to provide an anti-static effect. Tools and some equipment are coated with chemicals that mimic the lotus effect, causing dirt to slide off the surface. For now, it remains unclear how long this effect will last and how it will impact the ergonomics of handheld tools. The plan for dealing with existing contamination involves the use of an ultrasonic device that creates vibrations. A lunar vacuum cleaner was first conceived back in 1991, but the plan was never implemented because it wasn't considered necessary. By 2021, several prototypes had been developed, one of them by students participating in a NASA collaboration program. Where constant vibrations fail, scientists propose repelling fine particles with an electric field. Larger particles, on the other end, would become charged and be drawn to special collectors. Such technologies are applied to lunar rovers and other devices with rotating components, where it is crucial to prevent dust accumulation and difficult to clean contamination by other methods. The crew will not be able to carry much equipment or spare parts, since developers must adhere to strict limits on hardware weight and maintainability. It is therefore important to strike a balance between strength and lightness. The payload capacity of the SLS rocket, which is planned for the Artemis missions, ranges from 27 to 46 tons depending on the task, whereas the Saturn V rocket in the 1970s could lift up to 48 tons. In addition, sunlight creates extra challenges since the moon has no protective atmosphere. Temperatures range from negative 173 degrees Celsius at night to plus 127 degrees Celsius in the sunlit areas. For about 14 days, the lunar surface boils and seethes under the direct impact of intense solar rays. The following 14 days pass in complete darkness, making the moon one of the coldest places in the universe. Taking this into account, NASA is developing an energy distribution system that could supply astronauts with electricity throughout the long lunar nights lasting weeks and which could also be applied on Mars. If humans are to spend extended periods on the lunar surface and build permanent habitats, engineers must prepare in advance for all the dangers awaiting future colonists. There is no place harsher or more unforgiving for human life than the moon. And yet, because it is so close to Earth, there is no better place to learn how to master an alien environment. That's all for now, friends. Leave a like if you found the video interesting. Share your thoughts in the comments, and see you soon.